We're going to start this morning with a video song. <laughs> and as soon as it gets going, we will. Your grace is enough. We're so glad that those of you who are with us today are sitting in the pews and singing and worshiping with us. And for those of you who are worshiping at home, we welcome you too. We pray that this is a day where we truly understand and know that his grace is enough. Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, for my, by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of work so that no one can boast. That's Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. And we just sang about that. His grace is enough. But we know, we know no matter what we do, we're going to mess up. But even though we are sinners, his mercy 
is more. We're, gonna, we're just going to worship God today. Remember his grace and his mercy. And we're going to sing his mercy is more. Wonder, 
going to do something a little bit different today. Uh, we haven't done it for quite a while. You know, with all of the changes uh, that are going on, and we've been talking about a lot of them uh, over the last few months, and uh, everything just keeps changing, it seems, daily uh, in the world. One of the things I, I know, like you, one of the things I like to do is to find some wise people, uh, somebody that I think has a broad perspective, somebody that could add some insights and really uh, help me understand a, at least a little bit better what's going on, and I think you as well. Uh, today, I, I'm just honored uh, to be able to, to uh, invite Lynn Laughlin uh, up to the stage uh, because I've known Lynn my whole life, literally. <laughs> I think I was probably born on a Friday and uh, met him the next Friday or something. I don't know. Uh, a lot of close uh, family connections there, but um, his role at Lincoln Christian University, uh, he'll tell you how many years in just a little bit, but um, has left a huge impact. And just recently, Lynn has stepped down from a very active role. Uh, he's not in retirement because he still works, okay? Uh, but uh, it's for the university. And I'm just, I, I, I just wanted to get him here, okay, uh, to be able to share with us uh, so that we can kind of pick his brain and also just appreciate uh, all that he's done for the kingdom of God. So Lynn Laughlin, would you please uh, come join me on stage, please? And would you help me welcome Lynn? Okay, Lynn, I, I think I've got 20 questions for you today. And, uh, I thought or at least, there was only 18. Okay, well, you know. Okay, that's fine. I'll throw in a couple of extras. How okay, about that? Okay, that's fine. Um, first of all, how many years total have you been in ministry, okay? And what in the world ever made you want to go into ministry? Um, I've actually been in ministry. I was thinking about that, and David sent me these questions yesterday. Uh, no, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> He sent I could have waited till this morning. Ago. Yeah, that's, that's true. Um, actually, I think I started when I was a senior in high school. Um, and then when I was a freshman, um, we had a guy who was a youth minister at our church at Westside where I grew up. And um, I think he actually, I was teaching, you know, with helping with a fifth and sixth grade uh, youth group. And that would have been in you know, the fall of 60. So. Wow. 1960. So, <laughs> not some people would 18, refer to as 1860. Yeah. Okay. But that's about when I started. So, 
um, right at 60 years of ministry. Wow. And it has gone on. I mean, beyond the point of being involved with the youth there, I, I think I preached my first sermon when I was a, a freshman because I played basketball. Mr. Henderson was my coach my junior and senior year, but his first two years he wasn't at school yet. He was down at Louisville uh, getting his doctor's degree. So I actually, um, the coach asked me, didn't ask me, he told me I was going to preach for him over at Lighterberry. So went over to Lighterberry and preached my first sermon. And then that's the summer of my sophomore year, um, I started full-time with preaching and then by January, that the, my, the following, when I was a junior then, I ended up going to uh, Pleasant Hill Christian Church and ministering there and driving back and forth to Lincoln during that time. So, so you've been in ministry as long as I've been on this earth? Uh, longer. Apparently. Longer. 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 <laughs> okay. So, um, that's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. Um, so, Lynn, based on your years on earth and just the wisdom that God's given to you, uh, and you, you've seen what all's going on in the world today, what concerns you the most about what you see happening? I would guess the, my, my biggest um, angst is the fact that what I observe and what I see is what's happening, not necessarily in the world, but what's happening with the church. Okay. And um, I, I have a very um, strong opinion uh, from the standpoint of, I know that Jesus said the gates of hell would not prevail against his church, uh, but boy, it sure seems like uh, we've had a lot of, just uh, we, the, the walls are, are not caving in. I don't mean to say that, but they are certainly, um, there's, an, a, there's an, a, an attack upon the church. I think it comes, first of all, because uh, the Bible is being challenged at, yeah. to all of its authority, and whether or not there's any truth or it can be any value found in the Bible, that's being questioned. Um, I think one of the surprising things to me is the fact that we have people who come to church and they're here maybe once a month and they're considered, you know, an active member. And I'm going, how can that be? How, how can you just attend church once a month and be an active member? Um, I think the value, the value of the authority of God, I guess, is the real issue, the bottom line, that Either he is the one who created this world and he is the one who set it all in motion or he isn't. And if he isn't, then, you know, we don't need to be here today. But I believe that he is the one who did that. And therefore, we need to be in his presence. We need to be in, in worship on the Lord's Day, whether it's by, you know, uh, by video or, you know, um, technology is phenomenal. Uh, we have the same thing at our church. And uh, so um, from that standpoint, I, I think that's the thing that really concerns me the most. And I, I heard, I'm sure some of you are aware of who Ben Merrill is, but Ben Merrill is in his 90s now and uh, just a phenomenal preacher in the St. Louis area. But his big concern is once this is over, once the, you know, we get back to our, what we would call our new norm, whatever yeah. that's going to be, that there's going to be a lot of people who are not going to come back. And the fact that we have lost a sense of community in the process, and that has just been, uh, that has riddled, I think, the church. I've looked at the um, Christian Standard, which well, last month's issue talked about the churches that had their, you know, their, their COVID, the pre-COVID attendance, and then their online attendance during COVID, and those that had some church going on, and then, you know, what's going to happen in the future? Well, I, I'm just stunned when I see that we have churches that are half the size that they were, and, and even online has helped. But, wow, where are all those people? What, what's going on? So, well, I, I share those concerns with you. I think, you know, that the authority of God is, is going to be questioned, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and everything's going to fall uh, that tries to replace that authority. But I think the community aspect, I agree with you. I think that's a concern. Um, I think... As a, as a, not just as a church, but as a, as a society. We have to figure out what community oh, looks like. Right. You know, because it is very different. So I, I'm anxious to see how that turns out. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how, um, you know, because like you said, the, the, the church may be getting beat on a little bit, but uh, it's going to survive because God's going to make sure that it is. It is. I just want to be able to see what that is. Yeah. I you know, I, you, you look around the world and see where the church has been, has suffered and has been persecuted, and it's growing. Yes. 
I mean, it's yes. growing. It's unbelievable. I, I saw some statistics in Ghana. What's happening in Ghana? I mean, it's just amazing to me. The number of new churches that are being established yes. in Ghana, the number of people that are being baptized yes. in Ghana. Yes. I, it, it's just incredible. It is. It is. You alluded to it, I think, a little bit um, earlier when you talked about when you went to, to uh, school and, and growing up at Westside. But what made you want to be a part of Lincoln Bible Institute, Lincoln Christian College, and Lincoln Christian University, okay? As a student, okay? okay. And then, like you said, you, you got there and you never left, <laughs> okay? That's true. Um, that so is true. what made you want to go there as a student and then stay as a faculty member and then just throw in how many different roles or hats okay. you've worn at the school? Okay. Uh, it all began, uh, you know, my father was a minister at Westside, and um, I grew up in the church. I mean, not that I really had a choice. <laughs> uh, but uh, Some of but us can relate I, to that. <laughs> but I'm privileged. I, I truly believe that I am privileged because of that. Um, we, were, we lived two doors from the church. I mean, two houses away from the church. And uh, so Sunday was, uh, we were there. I mean, Every Sunday, there wasn't a choice. It wasn't a, are we going to go to church today? No, we're, there's the church. We, we need to be there. So it was never, and I never felt as if my parents pressured me to go. I never felt like I had to go. I wanted to go. Yeah. Uh, it was just a joy. And it was Sunday morning. It was Sunday night. It was Wednesday night. Um, I, my mom took me along to youth group. She helped with the youth group at Westside. And I went, I remember going over and sitting trying to be quiet, um, and sitting there in youth group and listening. Um, and then when I made the decision, I was a junior in high school, I made a decision I wanted to go to, to, um, to I wanted to, well, I gave my life to full-time Christian service, what we call it then, and uh, committed myself to that. And then when I was a senior, uh, my folks both had graduated from Cincinnati. And so um, I, I just said to my dad, I said, where should I go to school? And he said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to preach. I want to be like you. I want, to, I want to preach. And he said, well, there's only one school that I know of that's really pushing that, promoting that, and that's Lincoln Bible Institute. And I said, fine, that's, you know, that's where I should go. And so up to Lincoln I went. And um, I can honestly tell you, though, however, that I was thrilled in 1962 when I was a sophomore that they changed the name of the school. I, I hated to tell people where I was going to school. I was going to an institute. I mean, the word Lincoln Bible. <laughs> Lincoln Bible was never a problem. Lincoln Bible just rolled off my lips. But institute was just because if some, and some of you know, there was an institute on the south side of Lincoln, Illinois. Okay. Yeah. And so I just hated, all my friends were going to colleges, universities, you know, and everybody was going, and I was going to Lincoln, Lincoln Bible. And the fact that, I, that everybody knew that I was, my football coach called me Matthew. That was the only biblical name that I knew that he knew of, although he <laughs> referred to Jesus several times during practice and the games. But When you did well, right? Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> but anyhow, I was thrilled when we became Lincoln Christian College. I was just that was a blessing from above. That truly was. And the, the thing, the funniest thing about that, Dave, is the fact that when Hargrove said it's going to be Lincoln Christian College, it was over. There was no focus groups. There were no focus groups. <laughs> there was no going around, talking with people, trying to get them to understand. Hargrove said it's going to be Lincoln Christian College. Okay, thank you. So, Same authority of the Bible there, yeah. right? Yes. And then when I went, to, when I stayed at Lincoln, you know, they asked me if I would you know, wanted to stay. In fact, Mr. Henderson is the one who kept telling Mr. Webb, who was the academic dean, I want Lynn to stay. I want him to be my assistant coach, and he can run the, the physical education program and start its master's in New Testament and seminary. And so I went into Mr. Dean, or the dean called me in, and he said, Lynn, he said, uh, talk to Marion. I'd never known him as Marion. <laughs> <clears throat> um, it was always coach, or Mr. Henderson, or even at that time, Dr. Henderson. And so I walked in and he said, you know, Marion's been talking to me and he said he'd really like for you to stay and I want you to stay. And so be, become in charge of physical education, become his assistant coach. And uh, then when he retires, you can move into being the head coach. And I said, okay, that sounds like 
what I would enjoy, but I was still preaching at, at uh, Pleasant Hill, and I did that for 13 more years on the weekends, driving back and forth. But besides being in charge of physical education and then being his assistant coach, then I became the head coach. I did the same thing in baseball with Mr. Henderson. And so I was the assistant coach, and I became the head coach, and I became the athletic director. I started teaching New Testament. I did that for about 10 years. And then um, I became the, um, I was involved in student services. And one of the questions that he was going to ask, but he, he struck it out here, he said, did you ever have a bad hair day? Well, it was a long <laughs> hair day because <clears throat> I was the dean of women <laughs> for a semester. <laughs> the longest period of time in my life. <laughs> I had no idea. Our dean of women decided to leave. Tom Ewell was the dean at the time, and I, she left, bless her heart. And uh, Tom, Ewald? Tom Ewald asked me. She left. No, he. Oh, he the, asked the, you to. Okay. He, she, she, the gal that was you. in charge. I got you. That's she right. left. He said, Lynn, could you just fill in and be the dean of women for a semester? <laughs> I said, what'd you say? <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, I, but I went on. I, I was involved with admissions for 15 years. I became the dean of students for a while. I became, um, and then I started in with interim stuff because I was the interim president for six months. I was the interim director of advancement. I was the interim director of I, I went back to being the dean of students because they brought two young men in, and I had to counsel them and bring them along. So I was, I was doing the alumni work, but during that time, I was also helping again with dean of students. So I, I had a number of... It's, it's, it's harder for me to even to go up to campus and show you all the offices that I had. <laughs> and then they built the gym and put my name on it, put our name on it, the Laughlin name on it, and somebody said, well, I know you, you have an office there. I said, no, I never had an office <laughs> in that building. Should have, but I didn't. So. But well, it's, Dave, it's like getting a road named after your family. So, well, yeah, anyway. yeah, yeah, it's similar. Yes. Um, hey, as basketball coach, okay, you, you probably saw some <clears throat> amazing talent. And uh, here at South Fork, we've heard some, about some of that amazing talent. So who was the better basketball player, Lynn? You, Marion Henderson, Butch Donaldson, or Mike Bro? Mm. And some of you don't know all those names, but they've all been associated with South Fork at one point or another. So, um, well, I don't know if Del Donaldson could identify a basketball two out of three times. <laughs> so we'll we'll dispense with well, Del. I'm sure real put Dan Clymer in there, but I oh, you uh, could, and I, he I could. I know, I know he could was. identify a basketball two out of three times, but um, Bro Bro came out for basketball. He didn't stay out very long, which was uh, which was a shame because and he he accused me one time. You know, he went on to be, and still is, a great preacher. And uh, he accused me one time, I was in the audience, that I cut him. And I went up to him afterwards and I said, I never cut anybody from the basketball team, particularly you. You left. Your cousins came and they were much better than you. But I did not cut you. So, But Henderson, Henderson was a great shooter. I mean, I still, the guys that played with him when he coached played, basketball at Lincoln. They, that's all they could talk about. That two-handed, what they had called the two-handed, some of the older people here, the two-handed kiss shot where the ball was, you know, he had both hands on the ball and just right here and, and launch it. And he could... Did he they have a, the bottom of the peach basket cut out by then? Or did by then, they, to somebody broke it out. Okay, they broke okay, yeah, it. Yeah. Just, just wondering how, yeah. you know, if, how, how far basketball had yeah. been during that time. So, Hey, Lynn, let's, let's jump into talking about some students, okay, and, and things that you've cha seen change there. What were students like when you first started working at the Bible College? Okay, just not, not as a student, but when you started really observing what was going on, what did you see in the students? Well, I saw a lot of young people come who, who had, and in my estimation, who had very good Bible knowledge. Um, they, had, they, were, they were committed to doing something for the Lord. Uh, the reason they came was because they wanted to go into some kind of Christian service. Now, I realized that as, you know, as the years went on, that a number of those who came for those reasons, some of them didn't get into those things that they wanted to. But when they came, there was a commitment. I, I mean, I remember um, it was easy to get a group of people. You, if you were going to go somewhere on the weekend and somebody needed somebody to go, 
you had all kinds of volunteers. I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. And it wasn't like driving 15 minutes down the road. It was like two or three hours away. And, but the kids were ready to go. They were ready to serve. Uh, they wanted to be involved. I was on a, a, a gospel team, what they call a gospel team, my freshman year. And um, we went multiple places. I, I think, you know, Terre Haute, Indiana, and other places of that nature. But, I mean, we were over in Indiana, and, and we traveled throughout the state of Illinois. The kids were wanting to be involved, and they were not afraid of those kinds of things. And one of the things that I think that, that has, that has uh, concerned me is the fact that they came from churches where yesterday we had a, a mission committee. Uh, actually, there was a mission board meeting at Tower Hill Christian Church where I go now, and um, they had the mission from Mexico in. And Hill uh, and his wife, Debbie Calderon, were there. And I, it was amazing just to sit and listen to them talk about what's going on in Mexico and the churches that are thriving. And I know that when I was at Westside and the missionaries came, I was just enthralled. And, and back in the day, they didn't stay elsewhere. A lot of them stayed in our home. Uh, we were two doors from the church. And so I was constantly hearing great about good people, wonderful people who were serving God. And I was at camp at Lake Springfield, and they would always have a missionary there or somebody who represented some kind of mission. And so that was all around us. And unfortunately, that has just kind of disappeared, which is sad. So contrast that then to what Bible student, uh, Bible university students are like today, okay? You said there's an eagerness on their part, a willingness to serve. Is that still there, or is it, is it different nowadays? It's a different, it's a, it's a different approach from the standpoint of not that many people are going out on the weekends okay. to serve. Uh, churches, number one, are not asking them to come out. Um, I remember when we started, when I was in a sophomore, and I was in homiletics, as you were, and you had to have so many sermons that you preached. And the problem was today is the fact that we just don't have that many churches that would allow a 18, 19 year old kid to come in and preach on a Sunday on a Sunday morning. So but back in the day, it was Sunday night and you could find a church anywhere you wanted to go. Because the preacher to preach. wanted a night off. Yeah, he wanted a night yeah. off. And so we'll invite this 19 year old kid to come in and, yeah. you know, blunder through a sermon for <laughs> You know, 10, 15 minutes, and he thinks he's talked half an hour, but he's only talked 10 minutes uh, and been sweating hard. <laughs> so, and everybody's uh, nodding. Yeah, and everybody all and smiling yeah. and being wonderful. But the point is that there are not those opportunities now for our students. Okay. And I think if, we, if, if it was available, I think that they would be willing to go. Um, but they've not come in with the same um, surrounding, the same... Um, concept of what church life is all about, of what it could yeah. be. Yeah. Obviously, there's some great Christian kids uh, that don't go to Bible colleges, okay, or Bible universities. They go to campuses, and they make a huge impact there. As you've been able to interact with those two different groups of people, okay, the Bible college students and the non-Bible college students, but still strong Christians, what do you see as the difference? I mean, what, what, what's the driving, what's the, what's the motivating thing for them? Well, one of the things that I think is it, for the kids that come to Bible college, the reason they've chosen to come to Bible college is because we still teach the Bible. Okay. It's 30 hours of Bible for everybody. It doesn't make any difference if you're a business major, you're a preaching major. Okay. You, if you're a preaching major, there was more than 30 hours of Bible. But if you were a music ministry major or a psychology major, you're going to get 30 hours of Bible. And so our kids that are coming now are still being taught the Bible. The kids that go off to universities, if they, find, if they go to a campus ministry and they get plugged in, some of those campus ministries are dynamite. I, 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 uh, the one at Eastern uh, has always been great. Um, the one at, at Terre Haute at Indiana State has always been good. Uh, you can name the, ones, the one at Purdue, the one at uh, uh, ISU got stronger uh, and has done a pretty good job, but not... What's the amazing thing, that, and it bothers me, is the fact that a number of our Christian church kids that go to Bible college or that go to regular schools or uh, universities or colleges are not necessarily hooking up with the don't ministry. Connect. They don't connect. Right. And two out of three, their faith is gone. I mean, yeah. 
and maybe one out of three survive. And because they don't come back home, uh, they don't find another church, um, that, or they don't find a church. They just kind of disappear. That, I mean, and they go in as strong kids. I, they've been to CIY, they've been to camp or whatever, but they get there and... and um, I think it goes back probably to what you said originally was your main concern is the authority, you know, God's authority has been questioned and you go to a secular university and that's just even more, you know, oh, hammered at them. And, and, and if we can, you know, teach our kids in churches how to think, you know, and how to react and, and to, to live, you know, that, those right. Christian principles, then that's going to make a huge difference. So I think, yeah, I, I'm amazed at kids today who can go to, you know, a, a secular campus and, and have, in my opinion, a huge, huge impact. You know, mm -hmm. on, on groups of people that I would never reach as a pastor or as a preacher, uh, but they can because of who they are and how they're living. So I, I, I'm grateful, you know, that there are those student ministries and, and those kids that are going there. So when you look at Bible college students today, Lynn, what do they need the most? Okay. Or, or I'm sorry, I, I, let, me, let me change that. What do they care about the most? Okay. Um, they come in and what do they want to do? Most of them come in with an idea of doing something significant. Yeah. I mean, they really do. It's not like they come in with, you know, a blank, in a sense, a blank slate, but they really want to do something. And so what they find themselves doing, I know that uh, our student cabinet has been a very strong influence uh, of the school of, of late. And the young man that's in charge of it this year, uh, Bryce, just a, from Indiana, just a great young man, um, but he, he was, his emphasis was upon, first it was on about community. Yeah. We need, we, we are strong as a group and we can become stronger as a group as the more we grow in Christ and the more that we serve. And so his emphasis was trying to get our kids out into the community to help serve, to do something. To make a difference. And, and to, to do make what a they difference. Want to do. Right. Yeah. To, to be able to, and, but, and the other thing that, that our kids are, are coming in with is the fact that they see injustice all the time. Some of our kids respond well to that. Some of the other kids um, are become, I, I, I feel like they come in and their parents or people who've had influence on their life, uh, they come in with some baggage about what, what is justice. The in, they see a lot of injustice, but they're having trouble to figure out how to, how to fix that, how to make, how to make it different. Uh, and so, and I can also tell you that um, I know when I was growing up in Springfield as a kid, I went to Springfield High School. We had four black kids in the school, four at Springfield High School when I was in high school. All the other black kids were at Feichens, which is now South East or Lamphere. And um, we only had four in the entire high school. We had 2,000 students, we were only four. And, but our kids are growing up, you know, if you went to Springfield High now, you know, it's, it's probably 50-50 or maybe even more than that. And so um, our kids are coming in with a, a different attitude yeah. in many cases um, and not always the best, uh, which, which is not, not a, a pleasing thought to me at all. Yeah, I, I've kind of sensed that, you know, there's a strong desire in, in youth today to really make an impact in their communities. Mm -hmm. And social issues are, you know, up there. It's huge. And being able to present social issue, you know, correcting social issues from a biblical, you know, worldview and, and a biblical perspective, we all know that's the only answer. You know, that's, that's the way that it's going to work, yeah. you know. Uh, so I'm glad, you know, that you guys are doing that and helping them, you know, to, to have those opportunities. So, um, hey, Lynn, you, you, you've made a million contacts, okay? In fact, I've even heard that when Siri has trouble finding a number for somebody, she contacts Lynn. Um, <laughs> because how big is your Rolodex? I mean, I, I'm sure you started out with a Rolodex, and now it's probably on your phone, but how many contacts do you have in that thing? I mean, I've heard everybody calls you, even Siri. Well, I don't know about Siri, but, <laughs> but a lot of people do call me. Um, and, and I tell them I, I truly am blessed because of the fact that I've been at school that long, yeah. and so, and I've had, you know, I've had students that were students when I was there, people who were older than me, that, and I knew them because they probably had been at West Side at some point in time, and I met them when I was in high school or at camp, because a lot of the Bible college people were at camps, and Henderson Coach was at camp when I was at camp. And I'm not going to tell you the story because I, I, I had to tell him one time. 
a, a, a story about camp. And so he said, what? I said, yeah, that was me. Anyhow. <laughs> he didn't believe it, though. I'm sure he, he, I'm sure he did. Yeah, he, he couldn't believe that. But I, I've, I've known these people, and I've known, you know, like, and now their kids are coming or their grandkids are coming. And I, you know, I can relate to that, and I know that. And God has blessed me with a good memory. Um, and I've got an orange book that was the alumni book, and there's a lot of stuff written down in it. Uh, but my wife teases me because I've got in my phone, I go like this because that's it used to be there on my hip and not. Anyhow, there's a, well over 1,100 numbers in my phone as wow. we speak. And the amazing uh, thing is he knows when he sees somebody's face who it is and, and immediately can get, he, he recalls that, okay? Most of us are going like, I can't remember your name, you know, type thing. This guy remembers everybody's name, okay? Uh, in fact, if he met you back in 1962, he probably knows who you are today, okay? We'll, we'll give you a test later. Okay. Um, I just, I, Lynn, there's a couple things I want to I talk a little bit about. Um, the, the health of, of Lincoln Christian University and kind of what's going on, e even in um, Christian universities. You mentioned, you know, that your, your parents went to uh, Cincinnati. Cincinnati is closed, okay? Since let Cincinnati, Cincinnati no longer exists, uh, but Lincoln Christian University does. So what do you see taking place in the Christian education world that, um, and I want to expand that out of just the independent Christian churches, okay? Because, I mean, there are other universities like Olivet and people like that that are Christian-based. They're just exploding. They're, they're doing great stuff. They have great opportunities to teach a lot of Bible, sending out missionaries, that kind of stuff. Why is it that some are doing so well and others aren't? And then if Lincoln were to undergo a health assessment right now, Okay, what would you, how would you <clears throat> pronounce her health status? Well, to, to the first question, um, and that is the fact that uh, the health of our schools, just our, our church schools, um, right now uh, we've had three, hu I mean, Cincinnati was flagship school yes. for the longest time, and when they closed their doors, it was like, how could that happen? Yes. I mean, how could that happen? And I, some of you know who Bob Russell is, and, um, and I'm not name dropping, but I played basketball against Bob when he was a student at Cincinnati, and we're still good friends, talk to him quite often. Um, I called him, and I just said, Bob, I can't imagine what it would be like to have my school, my alma mater, close. And, um, and he, was, he was really upset. Um, and then, you know, Minnesota Bible College was, became Crossroads College, and they closed, and Nebraska Christian was a good school. Dick Wamsley from Taylorville went out, was their president for a while. And, um, and then he came back to Taylorville, and they were seemingly doing well, and they're closed. Hope International, uh, one of the questions was, you know, that you posed to me was like, you know, would, would, would we be an organ donor? Well, Cincinnati closed because they tried to reach out to Johnson, and they said to Johnson, because Johnson had already reached out and, and snagged up Florida Christian, paid off a hefty bill for them and kept them alive. And then Cincinnati said, can you help us? And Johnson said, we'd like to. And they started talking. And then all of a sudden, Cincinnati said no, uh, because they, wanted, they demanded that they would have half of their trustees would be half the trustees for Johnson. And Johnson said, you're the ones that are in trouble, yeah. not us. Yeah. And they said, no, we're not going to do that. I mean, we'll take a couple of your board members, but we're not, it's not going to be half. Cincinnati stepped away. They closed. Hope decided to help Nebraska, and they did it for three years, but it cost them a million dollars each year to keep them afloat. And the other thing that, that I've always been amazed is, like, Nebraska, there's not that many Christian churches in Nebraska. And therefore, they had a hard time. Minnesota only has a hundred, less than a hundred Christian churches in the entire state. Plus, the largest congregation there was something like 250. Uh, so you had churches that were smaller, and they really couldn't support the school. Um, I, I think personally, I think what's going to end up happening because we have a number of schools that are smaller, they're struggling right now. Uh, Summit, out in uh, uh, Nebraska is a small school. Uh, Mid-South is a small school. Mid-Atlantic is, is a smaller school. Um, Atla well, I can tell you this. Atlanta Christian College became Point University, and they basically don't have a Bible department at their school anymore. 
Um, they, it's, it's just an, it's a school. And, and I know that there's still being, there's a Christian emphasis, but they just don't have what they used to have. So it's, it's like, if you're going to exist, um, you're probably not going to be a Bible college. Um, and um, I, I foresee some of, several of other, our schools closing. And when they do, um, I think Johnson will be the last to close if that happens. And the other thing is, if indeed some of the bills that are in our legislature and our national government right now, if that happens, all of our schools will close yeah. because we will not be able to exist because of what we is coming you. down the pike. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, that's, and, and the reality is, if some of those bills pass, that's exactly what will happen because we will be forced to say things, do things, hire people that, uh, you know, we have to be very careful what we're doing right now um, uh, at school. We, we used to rent out buildings on campus. We don't rent that anymore because if you say yes to this group and this group comes along and they're opposed to everything that you believe in and you say no to them, you're going to end up court and you will lose. Uh, so... Which is probably why your new president, our new president, is an attorney. Um, a God, God did a tell, wonderful... Tell us about how, how you feel about Lincoln right now. Well, I can tell you this. Uh, you know, I, I was pleased when, when Keith Ray left as president and they began to look for somebody and they hired Don Green. To me, he was the only person they could have hired. Uh, they, they wanted to do... Our trustees wanted to do a national search. <clears throat> it just so happened that when the company that they hired, uh, hired somebody to be their point man, helping us to find a president. So it happened that he had been at Lincoln for one year, and we played basketball together, and he was a friend, a real good friend. Coincidence. And coincidence. And he said, Lynn, why don't you want to be the president? I said, I was for six months. No, thank you. <laughs> well, not looking to be the president. I was president for six months, and it was a long six months, and I, you know, I said no, and, I, and I'm too old. I, no, we don't even, but Don, Don Green is the person you need to hire, and eventually he was hired and became the president, and he was what we needed at that moment. God has always done that for Lincoln, in my estimation, and truly, Silas McCormick, God got him ready for this job. I mean, went off, got his education at Lincoln, then he went over to the University of Illinois and got a Ph.D. in education. He went to Ohio State and got a Ph.D. as a lawyer and came back and was at a law firm here in Springfield and decided he wanted to come and join us about eight or nine years ago and uh, has been an excellent person for us in, in the roles that he filled previously. And then his wife said to him, why don't you go ahead and put your name in as the president? And I, th I know he was surprised that Anna said that, but he, she said, I think you would, you would do well and you would like to do it. So, and we are blessed because of that. I can tell you that. Yeah, he's really sharp. I've known Silas since he was in fourth grade uh, over in Decatur. And um, great, great young man, great young man. And I think he understands students. He understands their social, you know, desires, but he can also lead that in a very mm -hmm. healthy way. So, Lynn, we're, we're pretty much uh, almost out of time here. Let me just close with one more question, Okay. And this kind of brings it home to, to South Fork. We're a small rural church, okay? We have limited youth. We hope to grow that. But how best can South Fork support ministries like Lincoln Christian University and other Christian institutions? How best can we do that? Well, I, there's, there's two ways. Obviously, uh, I know that this congregation has supported, <clears throat> supported our school financially through the years. Uh, you've always been a part of who we are. And we couldn't ask for anything better than you continue to support us. Uh, we have had churches who have uh, dropped us um, because they felt like their support needed to be elsewhere, whatever. Uh, so we, we truly need financial support. And the other thing is, and I am a firm believer, we, all, we need prayer. Um, the school needs constant prayer uh, from that standpoint. Uh, it's harder now to recruit students, um, I'm, and this is not just Lincoln. Uh, this is across the board for all of our schools. You mentioned Olivet, and um, I heard yesterday uh, that Judson College may be closing. Really? Yeah, and I, I'm just stunned. I, I am absolutely stunned, but 
And, and I was stunned when McMurray closed, you know, over in Jacksonville. I, I couldn't believe that they were closing. Um, but that's going to happen more and more, in my estimation, because of the financial situation. Uh, so you all can pray that, um, that we will become stronger um, and, uh, and try to influence anybody that you possibly know or care about or think might be interested in coming to Lincoln uh, to help them understand uh, what they can do with, them, with, with themselves and, and whether it's your grandchildren or who it is uh, to think about the possibility of being involved because one of the questions you asked me was, would you do, in essence, would you do this again? And I would, and I would be a preacher. I, w I would do it all over again, and I'd be a preacher. But I think that's, that's, that's all that we can really ask, that uh, church continue to support us. Um, it might be that, you know, you could call up there next fall and, and find a couple of students that are far away from home and uh, invite them to come down and, and to the church and um, bring them into your home and get to know them. And uh, uh, I, I, that used to happen. And... I, I think those days, I, I'd love to see some of those days come back from that standpoint. As soon as we get rid of those COVID restrictions, so That's okay. the students can go back and forth. Yeah. I think it's a great idea. So, Lynn, thank you. Uh, we're going to wrap up with just a word of prayer, and okay. uh, then you're going to help me out with uh, elder orientation here in a minute. But um, okay. let me just pray for you okay. and, uh, and the school thank right you. now. Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you uh, that there has been a, a, a school just right up the road called Lincoln Christian Bible Institute, Lincoln Christian College, and now Lincoln Christian University, God, because it's, it's impacted so many lives here. And, and God, I, it just, I thank you for the text that I received this morning from someone who knew this interview was going to take place and just shared how excited they were uh, for the lasting impact that that institution has had on four people directly, uh, closely engaged in their life. And so, God, I thank you uh, for the faithfulness of men like Lynn and uh, Hargrove and Henderson and, and just... McCormick, everybody, God, just thank you. Um, we are blessed because of them. So, God, I, I pray that you give uh, Lynn great satisfaction in what he has been able to do and that you would continue to use him. Uh, every breath that you give him, God, use him to continue to forward your kingdom here on this earth. And, God, I thank you for Lynn Laughlin. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Lynn, thank you. You're let's, welcome. let's thank Lynn. I'm going to take my chair and walk. We're going to transition into a time of communion now and um, just share together, uh, remembering Christ's death uh, and resurrection. And uh, I'm just going to tell a quick story about one of the bus drivers uh, that just really impressed me uh, a few weeks ago. She's brand new. This is her first year of driving. And um, she was all upset at the end of, of the day, and she was sitting down. And as bus drivers, sometimes we have to write up uh, discipline reports, okay? If something happens on the bus that we need to be referred to administration so that they can handle it. And uh, she's like, oh, I've never done this before. And she was all upset. You can just see visually she was just having this reaction to doing this. And, and so I said, you know, hey, what happened? She goes, well, this girl was being mean, and she was writing these bad notes. And she was just being a mean girl, okay? And I just, I don't stand for that. I don't like it at all. I, I, I'm going to write her up. I said, okay, I agree. Who is it? She goes, my daughter. <laughs> no lie. She wrote up her own daughter. And that just kind of resonated with me because I thought, you know what? As parents, oftentimes, we aren't willing to do that. We aren't willing to do something that might cause a negative consequence uh, to, to our kid. We, we want to protect them. We want to, we want to make everything, you know, right. And, and yet this, this lady was like, you know what? She was wrong. She has to learn. And I just related that to what God did for us. It was his son that he wrote up and sent him to a cross. Not because of anything that he did, but because of everything that we did. And, and so that verse, John 3, 16, you know, God loved us so much that he gave Jesus. That sometimes we just recite that and don't even think about the implications of that. I remember when Matt and Tracy shared on, on uh, Mother's Day uh, last week about, for communion. And, and Matt's first question was to... to to Tracy, could you imagine your son having to be on that cross? None of us can. We might be able to write our daughter up or our son up if they misbehave on our bus. But to sentence our own kid to death. 
That's amazing love. There should be some emblems of communion before you this morning. One is a piece of bread that represents the body of Jesus Christ that was broken because God said, you're the only one that can take care of this problem. And the amazing thing is that Jesus said, I'll do it. I'm in. And he never left his mission. So let's take this bread and remember that Jesus was faithful all the way to the cross. The physical torture was one thing, but the, the emotional, the mental, the psychological, man, how, how did Jesus do that? His blood reminds us that it was love. And it's his grace that's given to us through his love. Let's take that, that juice together. Father God, thank you that you were willing to sacrifice your son. Father, I, I can begin to understand why Jesus would cry out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he felt so alone in that moment because you carried through. So God, my prayer today is that your actions would produce in us a reaction of gratitude and of faithfulness so that God, your son, did not die in vain. But he died as a part of your perfect plan to correct the problem that we could not. God, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our worship team is going to come and lead us uh, in another song. Better than you, Lord, oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, oh, oh. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness. Failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen. And you still call me friend. 
Today we're going to just formally set apart uh, our elders here at South Fork Church. I'm not sure when the last time or if it's been done before where there's been an actual elder orientation uh, whereby we have called uh, the men forward uh, who have been uh, affirmed in that role of leadership, laid our hands on them and prayed. And I thought, what a great day uh, with Lynn being here uh, as an elder from Tower Hill as many years of experience in ministry to help lead us in this um, exercise. And you know what, in, the, in Scripture, uh, when um, a person was set aside to go on a mission or to preach, uh, the elders would gather them together, the apostles would gather together, lay hands on them, pray over them. Is there something really special about that? Do they get some special power or anything like that? Not really. But what it does is it affirms in them and it demonstrates, I think, and, and who knows what God does in that, um, ability to do what God has called them to do. So I'm going to call all five of our elders up this morning, and uh, if their spouse is here with them, I'm going to invite them to come as well and just kind of stand around this table. And then if Bob, if you and Delbert could pass out um, the sheets now, there's a little half sheet of paper uh, that we're going to give to you that has the chart that Lynn is going to be reading to the elders, and then the response that they will give. And then there's also a charge on the back, a three-part charge to the congregation. And we ask you to just read that and uh, respond as well, if you're willing to accept that. You know what? The, the commitments of the elders come right off of our membership policy uh, that we've introduced to you uh, of what are the elders committing to do on behalf of the church. We feel that's an important opportunity, okay, for the elders just to affirm that, you know what? We're in. We're all in. We're going to do what God has called us to do to the very best of our abilities with the help of God. So, uh, Ron, Ayers, would you please come? And uh, Shirley, if you would like to, to come on up, that would be great. Um, Hank, if you'd like to come on up, please. That would be awesome. John Ayers and Wendy, if you'd like to come up, please. Matt and Tracy Carls. And then Paul uh, Rydell and Bridget, if you would. Guys, just come and stand uh, around the table here. Lynn, why don't we step down here to the front a little bit. And what I'm going to ask is, if your spouse is here, they just stand behind you and just kind of put their hands on you and, uh, and pray over you. And then, Lynn, would you please lead us in this charge? This is not on the paper, uh, but I want to say it, and that is that this is not a position uh, to obtain but a service to render. And um, I think of John chapter 13, where Jesus washed the feet of the disciples and being the master, and yet he was the one on his knees washing their feet. And so as an elder, I charge you to be an example of maturing disciple of Jesus Christ, to possess the desired characteristics of elders as given in 1 Timothy and in Titus, to consistently study the Bible for biblical truth pertaining to cultural and contemporary issues, to pray for members, faithfulness, spiritual protection, and other needs, to nurture the church by ensuring the teaching of the whole counsel of God, to protect the church from false teaching and divisive behavior, to care for the spiritual and physical needs of members to the highest level possible, to hold one another accountable in all areas of doctrine and morality, to provide loving and gracious leadership to the congregation, and when needed, exercise necessary church discipline, following the model of Matthew 18, 15 through 17. Now to you, do you heartily accept the office to which you've been called, and do you promise to faithfully fulfill the duties of elder? Yes, by the help of God. Would you just join me in praying for these guys? Father God, thank you for these men who have been obedient to your call. Some have served for years, God, and we are so thankful for them, for the biblical wisdom, the knowledge, the experience that is represented in this group. God, we give thanks. This church is blessed. We ask you to bless them. And Father, may your spirit just ooze out of them as we meet, as decisions are made, as they pray in their own prayer closets each day, and God, seek your direction for your church here. God, I thank you for these men. I thank you for their spouses. I thank you for the, the sacrifices that they make and the support that they give. Father, may this church never take advantage 
never take for granted these men and their families that stand here today. Father, bless them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And now to charge to the church body. Have you, members of South Fork Church, seeking the guidance of God's wisdom, affirmed the men who now stand before you to be the elders of this congregation and to oversee the spiritual welfare of the South Fork Church? Do you wish them to be set apart to shepherd this flock as elders tended the flock of God in the early church? And will you promise to encourage and honor them in all things that are consistent with the word of God and with enthusiasm assist them in the discharge of their responsibilities? Let me pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today to share together in this ordination service of these men and the desire that they have to serve you. And as David has mentioned, that many of them have served for years, others are beginning. So we pray, Father, that you would direct their steps, provide for them uh, the source of power from your hand to be those men who would make wise decisions, who would accept this responsibility and inspire others to also attain to this kind of leadership within the church. I thank you for this congregation. I thank you for the years that this church has uh, been involved in ministry within this community. Father, for those whose shoulders that we stand upon, uh, for those who have gone before, we give you thanks, we give you praise. And now, Father, for the future of this congregation, and to the future glory and honor of your kingdom here at South Fork. I pray, Father, that you would direct them, bless them, and give them the courage to do the things that would always bring honor and glory to the kingdom, to your kingdom, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. South Fork is so blessed uh, to have such great leadership. And um, we had a, our first elders meeting with this group on Monday night and just some great discussion, uh, great vision of what they you know, want to see uh, happen here at South Fork. And uh, I'm excited about this, next, this new year. I hope you are as well. Uh, just real quick, a couple of announcements. Number one is um, uh, if you would like to give some money to Rena, today is probably the last day that you can do that. Is that right? Um, to help with the birthday parties out at Lewis Memorial Christian Village. You can give her that money and she'll take care of that for us. Also, uh, youth group will meet tonight uh, at 6 o'clock. And then also right after this service, if you can stick around for about 10 minutes or so, um, they're going to be sharing about Camp Refresh, which is the opportunity we presented last week about an opportunity that we want to minister to our community, Edinburgh and Rochester and, and the surrounding areas. Uh, with a kind of a tutoring camp uh, during the month of June. We really need to get a feel for how we're doing uh, as far as uh, adult leadership and support for that. So if you can stick around, that would be great. And uh, if not, you can give uh, Sharon or Shailen a call, and I'm sure they'll fill you in uh, afterwards. But really kind of need to get a pulse today. So uh, you've been seated for a very, very, very long time. And so I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to close with a song. And then as soon as we can reconvene, we'll start that informational meeting. Have a great week. Great week.